Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and welcome to Patron Hangout number 131. Okay. Uh, before I get started, I want to welcome everybody who's in the chat room, and I've already said hello to everybody that was there before the show started. So if you just came in, hi. Um, and if you'd like to be in the chat room, please go to the link below, click Patreon, join Patreon, five bucks a month, and you can come to eight shows a month and be in the chat room. Uh, all my shows are, uh, all my live shows are patron only uh, when they're live. And uh, so that gets you in early. And then uh, afterwards, I put the shows up to the public. So if you don't want to join Patreon, that's okay. P please do subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you get notified of all the shows that you can see, which is everything I put out. Um, and also check my playlist for any of the cases that you're interested in. Okay. And I just want to say right up front, <clears throat> as I start this program, that I think all of you being really mean to me who are in the chat room, because you're all saying that um, we should you should have a drinking game now that every time I lose a picture and can't find something that you should take a shot. And so now I'm just a drinking game. And I pretty much know if you came to my vanishing, uh, the vanishing triangle show, which will be put up uh, to the public uh, Saturday. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> Hi, cat. That's a very cute cat. It's not my cat. But it came through the cat door. It's now eating food. Wow, he's pretty. No, this is not my cat. I don't have a cat. <laughs> anyway, I'm hearing him over here. He's like chewing on the food. Hello, cat. He doesn't care about me. He's getting free food. Uh, stray in the neighborhood. Anyway, so if you came to the Vanishing Triangle and you were doing shots during that show, I lost like every picture ever. So you have to cart everybody out to the, the to hospital uh, for um, alcohol. Uh, yeah, you, you, mm. Yeah, you'd be in really bad shape. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think you're just all being really mean. Um, so, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> since since you're being that way and you think I'm going to mess up again tonight, I'm going to just say, what the hell? You know, I can join you. You're going to be like that. Yeah, sure. Great tequila. Uh-huh. I'll see how many pictures I lose after I chug this. There we go. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I might be drunk for the show. Maybe it'll do me good. Maybe I won't lose the pictures. Oh, my gosh. I got to take my glasses off now because for some reason I now see better without my glasses. And so I want to be able to read what you're having to say. All right. <laughs> wow. Have a cheap date. Wine fumes affect me. Wow. Be very careful. Be very careful. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I'm a good sport. Hey, I have to, I, I've always felt I had, you have to have a sense of humor. You know, if you're going to be in the public eye, um, you know, you have to, you really have to be able to get along with what goes on. And besides which all you guys are great, you know, and that's one of the reasons I do uh, my live shows for patron only because I do love the, the company I keep in these shows. So you're all, you're all fun. You all have a great sense of humor and it, it's awesome. So, oh, I'm thinking what time of day is it? Wait a minute. It's Christy says it's nearly five here in Los Angeles. You're good. <laughs> Some people, let's see. Australia is 11 AM. Okay. You can, you can still, you can still. Yeah. And, and for the UK, it's midnight. If you're, if you're still up, join. Okay. Let's see if I miss lose the pictures. That's really the important thing. I'm just amazed at this cat. Hold on a second. I gotta take a picture. Hi, cat, whoever you are. Oh, you're really cute. Really pretty. It's a pretty cat. It's not mine. <laughs> I wanna show you a picture of it. This is so cute. Um, let's see if I can I can pull it. Let's see if I can see it. Can, can you see that pretty cat? That cat is now eating in my house, although I don't know who that cat is. So the story is my my the cat next door, which is it was Kitty Kitty. Uh, that's a little black cat that my daughter owns. That sometimes it just likes to get away from the dogs. So it showed up at my house the other day. And so I, I defrosted some fish and fed the cat. And then um, the cat left. And I 
and some of the food was still there. And then it was gone the next day. And I thought the cat came back, but apparently the cat didn't come back. Apparently some other cat came back. <laughs> this might be my new cat. I don't know. My, my cat Ziggy died like six months ago. And I don't know. It's a really pretty cat. Who's ever, I just don't know where it, whose cat it is. Um, <laughs> oh my God. So, well, okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait, what's going on here? Wait, hold on a second. All kinds of crazy things are being said here. Um, <laughs> she's stealing cats. No, I'm, I'm told. I'm told that is a it is a um, stray cat, but I just don't understand how it's stray because it's, it's really a very good looking, very you know, well off cat. It's, it seems to be in good shape. So I don't know. I haven't seen that cat belong to anybody else in this neighborhood, but it's now rolling in. So. No, it's, it's Ziggy has not returned. <laughs> it doesn't look like Ziggy. But anyway, okay, enough of this. Um, I will lose all my subscribers or my new subscribers who say, are we supposed to be talking about crime? All right, let's talk about crime. Okay, first one. Let's see what picture I can roll through. Okay, let's talk about this guy. He's a fe lovely fellow. His name is uh, Je uh, Jeremy Pauly. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's his face is unfortunate. But what happened with Jeremy Pauly? He's a Pennsylvania man who was sentenced to probation. I, I always find probation interesting. It's like you somebody commits a crime, but they just get probation. Well, that's kind of cool. You know, I mean, to me, if I commit a crime, I should probably be charged with it and serve time. Well, he got probation. After he was found, they found buckets of human remains in his home. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, lovely, huh? So anyway, uh, he was sentenced on Tuesday to two years of probation after pleading guilty to a charge of abuse of a corpse. He was arrested in the summer of 2022, according to CBS 21, whoever those people are, local, local network in Pennsylvania, I guess. After law enforcement found five-gallon buckets filled with human remains inside his home in Enola. Um, he was sentenced, uh, let's see what happened. It was related to the state charge on the federal level. Oh, he got federal charges. All right. He's facing up to 15 years in prison after pleading guilty to conspiracy and interstate transportation of stolen property last September. Okay, so they gave him the probation because it was the local one said, we don't want to deal with it because he's got a federal charge on him. Now, uh, he admitted he admitted to buying and selling human remains stolen from Harvard Medical School and a mortuary in Arkansas. He also admitted to knowing that the remains were stolen. The human remains were stolen. So it wasn't like he's like, I don't know how you wouldn't know they were stolen. It's like, uh, my uncle Ernie like, died in my house. Can you, here's his remains. They weren't stolen. <laughs> Where would the remains come from if they weren't stolen? Right. He was one of multiple people, multiple people. See, I've drink, drank that tequila. Can I say multiple people multiple times? Multiple people were indicted in the case last June. Another man from Pennsylvania, Joshua Taylor, was char charged in connection with a federal case. Now, you might wonder, <laughs> says here. Okay, Scott, who's Scott? Oh, another person, Candace Chapman Scott whom Paulie bought the human remains from is to undergo a mental evaluation for, for a judge before her case can proceed. What? Okay. So Candace, whoever she is, she has a mental problems, but the others don't. Okay. Um, Scott worked for the Arkansas mortuary tied to the human remains ring. It's a human remains ring. Forget sex trafficking rings. we got human remains rings. Um, uh, they stated, the officials, that the body parts were taken without Harvard's knowledge or permission. Okay, so now you have to ask this question. What was he doing with them? What was he doing with them? Um, and it's actually very quite interesting. So um, you remember Ed Gein, who really, uh, who liked, well, he killed, he killed people and took their human remains and then, you know, used their skins and stuff to make lampshades. So this guy isn't a murderer. What does he do? Well, he's got this website. Uh, okay, that's not a good picture of the website. Hey, I found the picture. I just, it just doesn't show up well. <laughs> okay, but 
that's one of the things he makes with these skulls that he gets. Let me, I'm going to go to the website now. Now, I, I, I believe we can only drink if I lose the picture, but not if I lose the website, which is another issue entirely. Um, maybe this is it. Okay. It's got a website. You can go to it. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but you can go to it. It's called jeremyleepauly.com. It's still up. He says this, and this is, when you look at psychology, this guy is interesting. He, he said, he's got Jeremy Lee Pauly, and here he is. Is is The reason it doesn't show up well is because his website is very black in, as far as the art, artwork goes. Everything's very dark. As the lead preservation specialist of retired medical specimens, retired medical specimens, so they were specimens that were used uh, theoretically in, you know, showing students and science things and medical people, you know, and they've been retired, I guess, because they've, out, you know, they've, they've, they're just not so nice anymore. Um, but he is a <laughs> specialist. I didn't know this existed. A specialist a med of, of medical specimens and curator to historic remains and artifacts. Jeremy has dedicated his career to both his museum, he's got a museum, um, known as the Memento Mori, and to his efforts in the restorative and creative works of the Pauli Institute of Preservation. This guy knows how to make whatever he does sound really great, okay? Uh, through his work, he works to produce educational tools through reconditioning retired medical remains. They were retired. He stole them. <laughs> they weren't that retired. Um, by means of plastination, cor corrosion casting. I'm going to link this below just so you can go over there and check this dude out. Uh, an anatomical uh, mounts and all manners of preservation or sort of procedures. Now, I didn't, I'm not going to, I didn't show the picture that she, that's right below this because I thought it would offend people because there's a whole bunch of little babies in jars. Well, that's a cute little babies in jars. And obviously these are from abortions. Um, and, but they're not just babies in jars. He puts the babies in interesting positions in the jars and he puts babies next to each other in interesting positions. And, and one of the most interesting things he does, which is the Ed Gein thing, um, let me talk about his preservative preservation work. Oh, well, let's see, where is it? Um, he's got these different methods of preservation and mm -mm -mm, the pictures are, are concerning. Let's put it that way. But the one that really got me was that if you have a loved one, you might, you might want to take advantage of this. You know, if you have a loved one with a tattoo, he will help you because he will take the skin of your loved one with a tattoo and he'll preserve it so you can wear that 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 person's skin with a tattoo. Very Edgeen like <laughs> I'm going to say, this guy is very concerning. <laughs> um, but he has presented himself as this, you know, this artist uh, preserving things, you know, because it, it is important to preserve certain things for, for, the understanding of the human body and all of that. But he seems to really get off on it, shall we say. He gets off on it a whole lot. Mm -mm -mm. That's Jeremy Pauly. Uh, so he might be in prison in the federal, federal prison for hopefully a decade. And his museum, I guess, well, you know, I, I don't think you can visit it, but I think you can, you know, mm. he's, a char he's an interesting character. Um, yeah. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> I can't. oh oh sorry, we have, we have extra extra things that have to do with this. We have some side side conversations. So, um, as of oh, as a former mortician, you can't gross nor creep me out. <laughs> well, not you and not me, because we both apparently have passed the point of no return, but. And this is why, you know, if you're working in this field, you have to have a, a reasonable ability to withstand seeing things that are ne not necessarily overly pleasant. And by the way, uh, one of you uh, 
pointed me in the direction of the, there's a new series out called Catch Me a Killer uh, with, a, with a South African profiler in it. And a famous case begins the series and it's the um, station strangler in South Africa who uh, killed a whole bunch of children. And so I'm going to do that show this weekend. It will not be on Sunday because on Sunday I'm going to see the Monet exhibit. The Monet, no, the Monet experience where you go in and Monet is all over the walls and you, you know, it's interactive going there with my daughter and my granddaughter. Uh, and so I'm going to move the show probably to Saturday, um, but I'm going to do it on the, the um, Station Strangler. And one of the things that drives me crazy about this particular South African profiler, which I'll explain during that show, is that she has she keeps falling into the abyss and suffering this tremendous amount of anguish from melding with the minds of the killers because she's in the abyss with them. And I'm like, you might be in the wrong field. <laughs> I'm not saying what we see is pleasant, but if you cannot handle things, if you, if you get, you, you have this point where you start connecting to the point where you get, you're getting severely depressed or severely, you're just having problems with, handling it you in the wrong field you, you got some you got some issues and i'm not saying i'm not blaming you for feeling that way but you you might do better being a teacher or an artist or something else but if, if you're going to be in the field you know if you're gonna, you got to handle it you got to handle it if you can't handle it you should really get out of the kitchen you really do you, you should it's not good for you it's not good for anybody you're dealing with because you can't handle it I think it's, it's a cause so I'm going to do that show on uh, Saturday. Um, <laughs> disgusting. Well, it's not very nice. Yes, this is true. Um, um, so he's a, he's an interesting character. It's Ed Gein without the murders, but I just wonder about the guy. Mm -mm -mm. So yeah, don't go to the website if you're creeped out by it, but it's fascinating because he, what's fascinating to me is that he, he, he thinks he's doing, he's claiming, I don't want to say claiming, he's claiming that he's doing some kind of great work for humanity. And I'm telling you, he's getting off on it. There's a guy is sick in the head. He's getting off on it. He thinks it's cool because the things he's doing are not just preserving. They are perverting or they're, they're exploiting and there's a big difference between, I have seen, you know, there's a, there was a museum. It was at Walter Reed. Um, Walter Reed, he used to have it. I think it's up in Baltimore now. Walter Reed had this, this, these interesting, um, as a collection of uh, weird stuff and <laughs> medical weird stuff. And you go in there and you say, oh, that's a tumor. And that's, and it's a baby. And, you know, it was all these different things, but that was done medically. So, so people could see things for themselves, especially if we were going to be in the field of medicine. But this guy is, he's got some kind of paraphilia. He's got some kind of perverted ideas about things that get him off. I'm going to say, when you start saying you want to make Ed Gein clothing, <laughs> something wrong with you. And he probably, and he's, and, he, and it's something, Apparently, he's got to steal the stuff, too, so he's obsessed. So, yeah, I'm glad they got him. I mean, that guy's creepy. Um, yeah, si science in a museum is quite different. This is this is accurate, Sarah. It, it's different. I mean, it's the same thing as, you know, when we're talking about crime, too. There's different ways of talking about it. One is in a healthy way and one is in an unhealthy way. I hope I'm the healthy way, but, you know, <laughs> um, who knows? Um, Loretta says, beyond perverted, just lock him up already. I do hope so, but we'll we'll see how much he's going to get because he didn't harm anybody, but he's disrespectful. Uh, and I don't know that, you know, the problem comes down. He's a thief. He is a thief and he's receiving stolen goods. So that's the biggest thing he's got. But he is disrespectful um, to the remains of humans. And um, something not very nice about that. So anyway, that's, that's the... I found the, the pictures, even if you couldn't see them. So no drinking. <laughs> By the way, somebody even wanted me to talk about Mad Madeline Soto. Um, I will, but not here. I'm going to do a separate little show on that, just a video uh, talking about, because people have asked me, do you think uh, Madeline Soto's mother knew what her creepy boyfriend was doing to Madeline? 
Um, and if you don't know, Madeline Soto was found, her body was found, a teenage girl. Um, and the mother's boyfriend is very clearly the alleged killer. Um, but the question is, what about mommy? And so I'll do a whole separate thing on that. I didn't want to take up the whole show with that. So I'm going to do a separate one. After I finish here, I'll do that. I'll probably put it up tomorrow morning. So, um, so I'm not going to do it here. All right. Let me talk about this guy. This, this, this one, you know, um, I'm going to find the picture. <laughs> okay. The pictures are really freaking small. Okay. I'm finding the picture, but they're not. Oh, I see. Can't drink yet. Okay. This is Jocelyn Peters on the left and Cornelius Green on the right. Now, Cornelius Green, th this story is amazing because Cornelius Green is a middle school principal. He has been charged with the murder of the woman on the left. He hired a hitman on her. He's, just, he's a middle school principal. You think he had some principles, but apparently not. All right. Story. Meryl married. Okay. Dude on the right. Married. Uh, married Missouri principal got teacher in his school district pregnant. And then he paid someone to kill her. It's, it's, it's an interesting story because, Wow. You'll see in a minute. Okay, a former middle school. Oh, they fired her. <laughs> That's a good thing. A former middle school principal pleaded guilty to federal murder for hire charges after hiring someone to kill his girlfriend, an unborn child. According to the plea agreement, those plea agreements, they get on my nerves. Um, uh, Cornelius Green worked for the St. Louis Public Schools in Missouri. Okay, right there. Poor St. Louis. I don't know if we work for East St. Louis or what, we're in St. Louis, but I lived in East St. Louis for, I lived in St. Louis, but I worked in East St. Louis for all of, uh, I think, a week. And it's a rough area. Uh, so maybe they can't get good principles. <laughs> um, he paid a man $2,500. So I'm guessing he got him out of East St. Louis because $2,500 is pretty shabby. Now people will say you can get somebody for $200. So that's true too. But you know, you always think, I always hope that somebody wants to off me. I at least 10,000. Come on. Get, I'm worth at least 10,000, aren't I? <laughs> so somebody comes around and says, what, how much did you pay to get rid of Pat Brown? Oh, 300 bucks. <laughs> I'm like, damn it. Damn it. You know, but anyway, he paid $2,500 to kill Jocelyn Peters, who was 27 weeks pregnant with Green's child. This was in 2016. Green was, no, now here's where things just, it, it's fascinating to me. Green was married to another woman at the time, but was engaged in romantic relationships with several other women, including Peters, who worked as a teacher. Ladies, the dude was married. He's married. And he's like catting around with like a bunch of women. And you all don't know the meaning of birth control on top of it. So I'm not, again, not blaming the victim. She didn't think she was going to get murdered by this guy. But man, pick your men better. Married men are the ones not you don't pick, especially when if he's having sex with a whole bunch of women, I'm pretty sure that there were they're like little indications. And 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 it's so sad because I mean she lost her life and she lost her child's life because of this creep. I mean it's a creep, there's no question about it, but weren't there somebody else out there you could have messed with? Anyway, the man Green is accused of paying to commit the murder, a guy named Philip Cutler. And then so this trial is going to go on in March. Um, nearly a month before Peters was killed, prosecutors alleged that Green texted Cutler. This is how you catch people. <laughs> Idiots. It's called, you know, it's called, uh, you know, you're leaving evidence and electronic evidence. Asking him to come to St. Louis. The plea agreement states that Green then, I think that's, the Green stole money from the school where he worked and used it to pay Cutler. So he used the school's funds to hire a hitman <laughs> to kill a teen. So the principal of the school uses school funds to hire a hitman to kill one of the teachers. I mean, you, you, if I wrote a fiction story like this, somebody would go, come on now. I'm not, we're not, we're not publishing this story. It's too dumb. Apparently not. All right. So 
then what happened was uh, Green allegedly provided Cutler with keys to his to a car and to Peter's apartment before traveling to Chicago so he could have an alibi. So he gives, he gives the keys over and everything. He's like, he, then he runs off to Chicago. So I was like, I was in Chicago when she got murdered. Prosecutors allege that Cutler then entered. Here I go. I start laughing and people are like, Pat, it's not funny. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. I can't help it. I can't help it. Oh my God. Alleged Cutler then entered Peter's apartment and shot her in the head before calling Green to inform him that he had done it. Don't do that. You know, you shoot her. You don't want to go, hey, I just killed her. Oh, look, phone call to, to Chicago. I mean, these guys, I mean, you hired an idiot for a hitman and you're an idiot yourself. So it didn't turn out well for the idiots. Um, <laughs> the same day, Green bought a train ticket and returned to St. Louis and went to Peter's apartment and then went, oh, my God, she's been murdered. And he calls authorities to say she'd been killed. <laughs> so according to the plea deal, he expects to be sentenced to life in prison for the murder for hire. Well, I hope so. If he's sentenced to life, they will drop the murder charges against him, for which he could have faced the death penalty. Peters was beloved by her community and remembered as someone who cared about others. I know our family uh, wasn't the only person in St. Louis that loved my daughter, said the mother. <sighs> Unbelievable. I mean, you know, I just, sometimes I just, I, I, I just have to, I'll scratch my head. Okay. I'll scratch my head. Um, ladies, if you're out there in the world, uh, not necessarily in the chat room, but for God's sakes, don't mess around with married people. Make sure they're 100% divorced and don't get pregnant by anybody unless you're in a long-term relationship, preferably marriage. Why? Because you, you know, the, these guys do these kind of things. And I feel so sorry for her because she, everybody's, she's a beloved teacher, you know, the children that she was a teacher for, I mean, their teacher gets murdered. What an effect that has on them. Her family's suffering. She lost her child. She lost her life. It's just so, all such a sad situation because you're mucking around with this principal who's a, a psychopath and he's already, you know, he's married and he's mucking around with other women. I mean, it's just, the whole thing is so sordid and it's just so sad. And I'm glad he got caught because he's a piece of crap and he deserves to be caught. I'm glad the, 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 $2,500 was worth it to the, the killer because he's an idiot too. So I'm glad they all got caught because this woman did not deserve to be murdered. Um, and, you know, but why he felt the need to kill her? Why, you know, if he's, he's having sex with some, all kinds of women, I don't know why he, why can't he just oh, tell his wife who probably already knows he's cheating on her. Hey, I got this other kid on the way. So big deal, you know, but Apparently, he just thought he'd d divest himself of that, that that problem. And so it's, it's just <sighs> crazy. But, but at least they got caught because they're both were, the hitman and he were both idiots. Um, so um, <laughs> I've, I've never mucked around with someone already taken. Yeah. Ask for their, ask, ask for their, you know, really, it's, it's, I'm really strong on this because after I got divorced, there were some people who, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm separated. I'm like, separated isn't good enough for me. Separated means maybe your family would like you back. Maybe your your wife will get back together. Maybe your children would like daddy back. I'm not messing with you. You hand me, you hand me a divorce paper. All right. But without the divorce paper, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not messing with you. You better be single, widowed or divorced, but any kind of marriage on the table, I'm not interested. Um, and it's a way to protect both you and also to protect uh, the family of the person that you're mucking around with. Because you don't know if that guy's a big lying piece of crap. He's sitting in a bar and he's telling you, oh, my wife is a terrible woman. And I've been trying to get divorced from her for two years. He could be lying like a dog. He's actually going home during sleeping with her that night. Don't get involved in that mess. It's not good for you. It's not good for his family who may not have a clue that he's that much of a dog. <laughs> um, Yes. Separated is not single. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, so um, I must be the first and only, so only virgins. Woo! <laughs> anyway, by the way, in case you're wondering, some of what people are talking about, I did a, a, did a, a Dear Profile of Pat video. And it's called, Should I Have Sex on a First Date? 
Um, so I'll, I'll link that below. Um, I, and I, I discussed that issue uh, because it's about relationships and what you should be involved with. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting story about that guy. It's like, what the heck? Um, just as a little aside, um, there is a, um, let me see if, let me find it. <laughs> okay, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? The trouble is I add so many things to the page and then it does take me a wee bit of time to find things. And luckily most of you are patient. I found it so you can't drink yet again. I'm going to keep you off the liquor for quite a while tonight. Oh, I'm doing good. All right, I just want to read this. This is just a quick Dear Annie and just cracked me up. I just, I want to talk, a lot of times when I talk about crimes, I also want people to go into their own lives because even if you haven't, haven't been hit by a real crime yourself, a lot of times we deal with things in our lives that mess our lives up because we are unable to profile well enough. This one just, just struck me. Dear Annie, a friend has a one, a friend has a wonderful personality except for one thing. She is relentlessly critical. And I just burst out laughing right there. I'm like, she has a wonderful personality, but she's relentlessly critical. These two things do not go together. <laughs> So let's look at what she said to dear Annie. Dear Annie, I have recently made a new friend. Thank God it's new. You can get rid of it quickly. Um, <laughs> who has a wonderful personality, except for one thing. She is relentlessly critical. Whenever we get together, she tends to make snide remarks or point out flaws in everything from the food to the decor to somebody's outfit. I understand that everyone is entitled to their opinions, but her constant negativity makes it difficult for others, including me, to relax and enjoy themselves. <laughs> but she's got a wonderful personality. <laughs> wonderful personality. I've considered addressing this with her directly, but I'm unsure of the best approach. Should I just grin and bear it? Because she's got such a wonderful personality. Or is there a way to address the issue without causing undue tension? Because this woman, who's your new friend, doesn't put any tension to your relationship, right? Because she has a wonderful personality. Let's see what Annie has to say. Dear Critique Fatigued, tolerating constant negativity can take a toll on your own well-being and the dynamic of your friendship. So it is important to address the issue and not just grin and bear it. Talk to your friend and offer specific examples to illustrate your point. But avoid placing blame or making sweeping generalizations. It's possible that your friend may not notice for how her behavior is affecting others. <laughs> Annie, <laughs> the woman is a massive narcissist. She doesn't care about others. <laughs> she likes to lord it over them and make herself feel better. She may be receptive to the feedback. No, she's not going to be. Or she may be, get defensive. You think? It's important for you both to approach the situation with open-mindedness because She's got such a great personality. She's going to be open-minded. And mutual respect to work toward a resolution. I'm going to tell you what the resolution is. Run like hell. <laughs> this is not a person you want to spend time with. Why would you want to spend time with a person who's relentlessly mean to other people, including yourself? Do you have that, do you have that like low an ego that you like, I'm so desperate for having a friend. I'm not willing to let you just stomp all over me and stomp all over everybody else. Run away. Run away. Annie, you should have told her to run away. What the hell? <laughs> but that so interested me because how do we view people? How do we view other? How do we view situations? Do we know when we shouldn't get into them? When we should get out of them? Because that that's our real life. That's our real life. Um, It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Don't get involved with stuff that's just not worth it. There are too many things in life that are worth doing, people that are worth being around, that we shouldn't throw ourselves away for people who aren't worth being around. That includes cheating husbands, cheating wives, liars, abusers. Stop, stop, stop hanging out with them. Um, I just want to, I want to see what uh, Bluebell says. I had a long string of disappointments in dating. My friends were sort of mocking me for being picky. Me, really? One of them had two kids with two different men, a single again. She's no longer punk, po poking fun at me. Yeah, you know, the whole, the whole thing is like, people do, I've had that too. Oh, Pat, you're, you're too picky. I'm like, well, you know, I know that the guy, when I when I, when I I was, a, I bet it stopped, it stopped fairly recently because I gained a little bit of weight <clears throat> during COVID and I'm a lot older. Anyway, I, I have a monster, you know, that little red monster Miata. So I'm at the gas station, like 
five years ago when I was like, like running about 150 pounds. So I look pretty cool. And so I'm like gassing up a car and there would be some 40 year old, 45, maybe 50 year old dude coming along. Handsome guy. I said chains, <laughs> gold chains around his neck. And he's like, Hey, Hey, you, you, I like your car. I like you. So I don't know what it is, but I really attracted men in gold chains and parking lots. And they were handsome young, younger men. Seriously. <laughs> and people were like, maybe you should lower your standards. I'm like, not that far, you know? And yes, there are people that I could I have over the years. I've had opportunities to be with people, but I didn't think those people were worth being with. I'd rather not do that. And I think no male man or woman should go with somebody that is not respectful of them. It offers them something that makes them feel good as opposed to, well, I'm just going to lower my standards because at least the guy will, you know, at least the guy will live with me because he doesn't have a job. <laughs> and when you look at the Soto case, I've been looking at the Madeline Soto case to find out why the heck Madeline's mother was with the creepo dude she was with. I'm going to say desperation. They weren't married. I don't know why he moved in. I can't find any inform enough information on him to find out why he was even in her house with her teenage girl. But I'm going to think she lowered her standards a whole hell of a lot. So a whole hell of a lot. Um, so um, I can't find, did you find the criminal past on him? Send that over to me. I haven't found the links on that. I found that he's not a sex offender, but I can't find any real, uh, uh, what, 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 what? Oh, send it over to me, Sarah. Send it to me I'll, uh, before I do my show. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not an idiot. Hmm. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, Lum Illumine Inc. I like that. That's the test. Does this person make you a better person? Are you becoming less of a person? You were. Oh, that's very good. I like that. You know, we have to value ourselves. You can value other people too, but if, that, if, you, if other people bring you down, maybe that's not a person you should spend time with. You should spend time with people who you... You benefit and that they benefit you. It should be mutual. You don't want to pull other people down either because you're a piece of crap. But, <laughs> you know, and if you're a piece of crap, you should become an unpiece of An unpiece of crap or a piece of, how does that work? No, I've told people, for example, if you if you have um, addiction problems, uh, alcoholism, uh, you've been in prison, whatever, you have no business dating until you've got your life together. When you 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 are no longer involved in, in, in drugs, alcohol, or crime, and what two or three years has passed, when you have established yourself, when you've gotten to the point where you own your own, you have your own place, you can rent your own place, you have a job, you're you're, you're clear of any addictions, you you reestablish yourself as a good human being in the community. That's when you start dating. You have no business dating anybody before you're at that point using somebody else, moving into their house, having still problems going, you know, no, you have no business doing that. And if you're that person, accepting that person in your life, you shouldn't be. You should say, hey, that's not happening with us. You need to get your life in order and then we'll talk. And that also means, that's also true for families. Don't, don't, don't allow somebody back into your life, even if they're a family member who isn't doing the work. Let them do the work, then they can come back. Anyway, let me go on now. Hmm, what else do I have here? What photo can I not find? All right, checking my list now. <laughs> uh, Carly, Carly. All right, Carly. Somebody asked me to do the case of, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her name. I really am not. It's Carly Gousse, Gousse, something like that. And here I'm going to find a picture right away. No drinks. And here she is. This is, this is, um, She's a missing person and um, quite an interesting story about her. And I'm going to link below. Uh, this is her brother. And this is a video. This was a video that he did talking about she, his sister going missing, his older sister going missing. It's really heartbreaking. And he's showing how a family member, especially a, 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 a juvenile, deals with what happened to her. And he can't quite fathom it um, at all. And he says she's probably dead, but he he goes through different things that he thinks about. All right. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about this case. Um, and this actually, 
the best thing I got actually was off of Reddit, and it's called Revisiting Carly Gousset Almost Four Years Later. Um, and when did it happen? It happened, and she's been missing since October 13th, uh, 2018. She was last seen walking down Ponderosa Street toward California 6 early that morning. Uh, there have been no leads since. Now, the okay, the location she's in, hold on a second. Uh, well, I can't read that. It's too small. That's all the, that's a, I can, a lot of problem things are just hard to see uh, on, on the uh, thing. But let me see. I just want to tell you where she's from. Um, this is the Mono County Sheriff's Office. And I think that's, where the hell is Mono County? Oh, Bishop Carroll, California. Just want to put you in a location. She lives in an area that looks like that. Very desolate, very empty. And this is important with this particular case. Um, and what I found very interesting about the case often I talk about, do we have an actual hom do we have a homicide case or would you have a murder case? Do we have accidental death? Do we have suicide? I talked about some last week. I'm going to talk about this case. And then I'm going to talk about two cases in Mexico, American tourists in Mexico, um, actually three tourists in Mexico. Were they murders? Were they, what, what were they? And all the families believe they're murders. And so what, and this one as well. So, but this case was like this. Um, she's been missing since October 13th, 2018, seen walking away. Now, the night before Carly went missing, here's where this stuff gets interesting. She attended a party where she had smoked marijuana and became extremely panicked. She left the party scared and ran down the street to call her stepmother, Melissa. She lived with her dad and her stepmother. And apparently they seem to be pretty okay people. All right. Um, and begged her to pick her up. The rest of the night, she could not calm down. So, so the stepmother did pick her up. She got back to the house and she was like freaking out. She couldn't calm down. She even told her stepmom, Melissa, that she did not want, not want to go to sleep because she thought Melissa would kill her, her own stepmother, the stepmother. Uh, Melissa recorded Carly's episode to show her the dangers of drug use in the future. So this was recorded. This also was useful for the police. Though the recording was never released publicly, it is said the recording showed Carly expressing love for her parents one moment and scared of them the next. She asked them to call 911 and asked if she would live until tomorrow. The only fault I feel in this whole case is that I think the parents should have called 911. They should have taken her to the hospital. And if she wouldn't go to the hospital, they should have called 911 and had her removed from the house and brought into psychiatric care. They did not do that. And I think it was a horrible mistake. And I'm pretty sure that they feel badly about that, especially Melissa, who was with her the majority of the night, the, the stepmother. Um, and so what happened? She spit out some salad while attempting to eat and called it the devil's lettuce. She expressed the desire to read the Bible and paint her nails. Eventually, Carly asked Melissa if she would sleep in her room that night, and she did not want Melissa leaving her side. So for, so one minute she thinks her stepmother is going to kill her. The next moment, please don't leave. Please don't leave. Melissa woke up in the morning to find Carly oh, uh, awake in the bed at 5.30 a.m. So she did stay in the room at 5.30 a.m. When she checked on her again at 7.15, she was gone. The door was left ajar and her personal belongings, including her cell phone, were left behind. These time, This timeline changes with different articles stating she noticed it. Is, it gets a little confusing there. But um, there were three witnesses, though, two, of, two who were familiar with Carly, which is important. When you have witnesses and they say, oh, I saw a girl. Do you know what the girl actually, who the girl was? But two were actually familiar with her. Claimed to see her walking toward California 6, looking up at the sky, disoriented, and holding and waving a piece of paper around. Again, nobody called 911, which is kind of sad. But then people say, you know, is it my business? But, you know, as a teenager walking down the road, waving things in the air, maybe you should. But anyway, a th uh, so sh a thorough search was conducted in the White Mountain area. Helicopters and ground searches with cadaver dogs are used, and she's never been seen again. So the question is, what happened to her? She's never been seen again. Um, some part, some people thought, well, you know, her parents, her stepmother, or the dad has something to do with it. I don't believe they had a thing to do with what happened to that girl. I think the problem was she was psychotic. Why she was psychotic is interesting. It seems like there were some previous events in the past that she was having problems with paranoia and, and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and it sometimes happened with marijuana. God knows if she 
got marijuana with something also in it or whether she actually was saying marijuana when it wasn't marijuana because you know it's like you know it's like i only had two drinks but you actually had six and they were shots you know but are you, is she playing it down was it something else was it hallucinogenics was it meth was it something else but mar besides marijuana or was it marijuana that was doctored or was it god knows or was or was she was she at the teenage years ending going towards schizophrenia, which is a time when schizophrenia does appear, and also that marijuana has now been proven to be um, a trigger for schizophrenia um, in those years, if it's if it's you know whatever amount is being used. Uh, so what do I think happened to her? I think she suffered from a, a psychotic event. I think she went off paranoid. I don't know where she went to. They never found her body. And she, you know, is a very desolate place. So is it possible she just staggered off someplace and ended up somewhere they just never found her? Maybe. But there's also the possibility that when you're in that state and you're in the isolated locations, some guy will come rolling along and say, hey, you need a ride? And if she stopped being paranoid at that moment or thought she had to get away from the other people, she might jump at his vehicle. Or she might try to run away and he just chase her down and grab her and throw her in the back of his vehicle and take off and kill her. So she, either she was in a psychotic state and came to an accidental death um, or somebody grabbed her. But I don't think anything happened with the family. And I, it's just one of these really sad cases where teenagers get into drugs and uh, have psychotic reactions to the drugs or she was already headed towards schizophrenia and the drugs just exacerbated it and it's a it's a very sad thing but i i don't think the family had anything to do nobody nobody purposely came out and killed her so um i see no evidence of that um <laughs> trying to trying to see here uh hitchhiking she may have hitchhiked or she may have just been wandering about in a confused state and you know uh, unfortunately one of the problems oftentimes when when somebody gets kidnapped or abducted or you know, serial killers i mean it's like the guy like the serial killers like out there and he's like i'm just gonna go down to i'm gonna go get myself a, a, a some an egg mcmuffin from 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 mcdonald's oh look Girl, girl rolling around on the side of the road. Hey, you know, not as hungry as I thought I was. I think I'll grab her. You know, it can be that just, just that simple. You become anybody who's in that condition in isolated locations. You just never know what's going to happen to him. It's very, very sad. Um, uh, um, yeah, she's she's dead. There's that that's there pretty much is no. Yeah, she's probably dead. And the the, the little link, the link I'm going to put below with her brother. He, he pretty much knows she's dead. It's just, but it, I just like that um, video, not just because I thought it showed what the siblings go through. Sometimes we see the, the, the parents, but we don't see the siblings. And they suffer with that all of their lives. And it's just, it was such a sad thing. Interesting enough, her, her own mother immediately said she was dead. I think her own mother just, I think maybe she knew that the girl had uh, severe prop, some severe problems. And unfortunately, um, a lot of times, the teenagers start having problems with schizophrenia um, and such, or get involved in certain drugs that may make things worse. They don't get them into care early enough um, because it's like, oh, they're just teenagers. You know, we all did stupid things. Yeah, but this person's not doing stupid things. This person is seeing things that aren't there, and that's really concerning. So, yeah. Um, so, hmm. Uh, very, con that's very sad. So anyway, that was that one. Then somebody said to me, what about those guys that went missing that, that ended up dead in Mexico? Um, and let, let me do the first one here. Um, this is a firefighter. This is a firefighter. This is him in his firefighting outfit. Um, and his name is Elijah Snow. And here he is just, just right before he went missing. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, he didn't go. He didn't go missing. He was found dead. Iris before he was found dead. Father of two. Hands, uh, there he is. He's in his. his he's got even his uh, little happy. Uh, it looks like an Aloha shirt, but he's in Mexico, so he shouldn't be wearing an Aloha shirt in Mexico. But that's a whole other matter. Anyway, there he is. All good, right? So, what happened to the guy? What happened to him? 
All right. He's a Texas firefighter who flew to the Mexican resort of Cancun. So there's a lot of things going on these days where people say, don't go to Mexico because you get killed down there. Um, it's dangerous. It's super dangerous. And I spent a lot of time in Mexico. Most of the time, I don't feel endangered at all. I've been down there many times. But every city has its, I mean, there are cartels down there. You don't want to hang out in cartel territory. And anybody can get killed anywhere in the world. And what if we want to complain about one city in, in Mexico, uh, somebody got killed one in, during the year, we have to look at what happened to tourists in Chicago, tourists in Washington, D.C., you know, they've been killed there too. So, um, but in this particular case, what happened was this, he was celebrating his wedding anniversary and he was found dead with his body trapped in a hotel bathroom window. Elijah Snow, a firefighter in Arlington, uh, had traveled with his wife, Jamie, to an all-inclusive resort in Cancun. Got to watch out for all-inclusives. All-inclusives usually mean you can drink yourself to death. Okay. Um, and, Apparently, that's what I think happened to him. He drank himself to death. Uh, according to officials in the Mexican state of Quintana Roo, Snow got trapped in the window of a hotel several miles away from the one where he was staying with his wife. Now, that is interesting. It's, it's not his own hotel. He died of mechanical asphyxiation, according to the news people. Um, they, the family has hired a private attorney to investigate the case the attorney has allegedly obtained photos that show that Snow had been beaten and had bruises all over his body. But the Mexican officials say that Snow likely died accidentally. Now, this is very two very different things. And, oh, wait a minute, breaking news, Nancy Eng. I know you've been waiting for that all night. Nancy Eng, Nancy Eng, you know, down in Guatemala, breaking news. No, there isn't any breaking news. Nancy Eng is still missing. Her body is still maybe in the lake. But the, the theories go on. I'm not doing anything on it. <laughs> but here we have a guy. We've got these two theories. One is the police say it's an accidental death. And the other one, the, the family and the lawyers are saying, oh, my God, he was beaten senseless and murdered. How do these two things go together? Now, some people will say, the family especially, will say the Mexican police are lying dogs. They're protecting their country. He was murdered, and they're not going to admit it because they don't want to ruin tourism. Okay, so let's look at it. I mean, there's, there's some corruption down there. There's no question. Anyway, the Mexican officials say that he was trying to climb through the window when he became trapped. Due to his height, he could not support his feet when the upper part of his body became trapped. He lost mobility and there was no point of support. And they have ruled it an accidental asphyxiation. That's positional asphyxiation where you're in a position, you get stuck. The family disagrees and sister was murdered. All right. I'm trying to get back. Okay, where's the rest of the? All right, what? Sorry. Where's the rest of the article? Seriously? No, the article's vanished. Okay, that was the end of the article. Okay, the end of the article was he was murdered. Okay, let me see if I can find the rest of the story from another art from another article. Don't start drinking. Okay. Um, Okay. All right. Let's see if this is the one that has the, okay, the better information. All right, here we go. Better information. Found it already. I'm keeping it all sober. <laughs> all right. Now, what are they saying this? They have now, uh, they were, um, hold on a second. All right. They're suing them. They're suing. Now the family of this guy is suing the Mexican resort which I think is really interesting. And they're suing the local travel agent. Why? They say they're suing, uh, they, were, they were celebrating their 10 year anniversary at the Royalton Chic Cancun Resort and Spa when the father too is allegedly kidnapped and killed. She is seeking the wife more than $1 million in the lawsuit brought against the travel agency, the hotel, Blue Diamonds Hotel, and the Sunwing Travel Group. It's like everybody that had anything to do with them going to Cancun. Um, they chose this place. There's all kinds of other places they could have gone to, but they went there. All right. So this is what happened. Now, here we have the story of exactly what happened. The incident happened on the couple's first night, the all-inclusive resort on the beach 
front strip of hotels in popular Cancun tourist destination. According to the suit, the Snows arrived early at the resort before their room was ready. The front desk gave them some bracelets, which they could use to get drinks. It was 10 a.m. They went to the pool, socialized with other tourists, many who were from Texas. Uh, so the day wore on and hotel bartenders poured, served, and encouraged most guests to consume hard liquor shots that were handed out at will without regard to guest safety. You know, I'm really tired of bartenders having to be the ones to determine how much each person should get to drink. They're, they're, a bartender serves alcohol. <laughs> if you're above 21 years of age and 18, probably Mexico, but if you're, you're an adult, what you drink is what you choose to drink. I don't think that, you know, the bartender's busy. Hey, have a shot. And if you're walking back to your hotel and you're not driving, unless you drink to the point where you have alcohol poisoning, which you might've gotten during my show, if you were drinking for the missing pictures in the vanishing triangle show, <laughs> you know, you might have some issues, but Jen and people do drink too much and they drink to the point sometimes of alcohol poisoning or stupidity. You are an adult. No bartender is forcing you to chuck those shots down. Sorry. You, that, you know, you have responsibility for your own damn body. So anyway, they're saying that they serve the shots and encourage the patrons to become extremely intoxicated. Get drunk, dude. You know, really? Okay. So at 4 p.m., the Snows were given access to their room. They went inside, changed, and returned to the pool bar. You know, if you were already drinking too much, maybe you shouldn't go back to the pool bar. The Snows continued to drink alcoholic beverages provided by the same bar that had been serving them since 10 in the morning. Well, I hate to say this to you, but, you know, so you, so, so most of the, I'm pretty sure the guys serving the drinks are Mexican. See? So, and I have trouble telling people why. I have face blindness. I'm really pretty sure that these Mexican guys, see all these tours rolling in and out, they aren't exactly saying, I remember that guy and he's had exactly this many drinks. I'm pretty sure he's just like, okay, senor, have some more. You know, it's not their business. They, all these people running around. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, at 7 p.m., so now they're there for three hours. At 7 p.m., the Snows go back to their room, change their clothes for a dinner reservation at a resort's Japanese-themed restaurant. While at dinner, the Snows were served a bottle of Japanese sake. Now, you see how it's already going? They were served this. No, no, no. They ordered that. Or if it were put on the table because it's an all-inclusive kind of crap, you don't have to drink it just because it's on the table. But this was the only alcohol beverage billed to the Snows. Oh, they were billed or tracked as having been consumed by the couple, according to the suit. They ordered that. So they've been drinking since 10 in the morning, drinking, drinking, drinking all day long. Now they're just downing sake. Okay. Um, after dinner, the Snows walked to a martini bar. <laughs> I'm like, guys, nobody is making you go. From one bar to the next bar to the next bar to the next one. I'm going to a martini bar, for God's sakes. Uh, okay, so they went to the martini bar, bar on the same floor where they ordered where they ordered martinis. Uh, shortly thereafter, they moved to the lobby bar where they again served. They were again served alcoholic beverages. What they were forced? I mean, they're going to different places. It's like it's like doctor shopping. It's like, well, that doctor gave me you know medicine. I should you know some whatever, you know, whatever medicine I shouldn't be taking, but I got it from 10 other doctors too. So that's why I have so much of it. Okay. You're going from bar to bar to bar. These, these bartenders don't know who you are and they don't know how much you've drank. So unless you're falling on your face, they don't know. So now they get, they were served. No, you ordered, ordered, ordered alcoholic beverages at 8 40 PM. Jamie told Elijah that she was tired from the early morning travel. Well, maybe it's because she drank a hell, hell of a lot and was going to head up to their hotel room. Elijah said that he was going to finish his drink and then return to their room. This wasn't unusual as he was used to long hours working as a firefighter. <laughs> what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> you know, you're on your... <laughs> it's okay. 
But Jamie was exhausted from the long day of travel, so she took the elevator to the room and went to sleep. In other words, she was probably pretty trash drunk, and she just was staggered to his room, staggered to her room. The resort had numerous surveillance cameras located throughout, according to the suit. Cameras were plainly visible at the entrances and exits to the hotel and throughout the common areas. However, many of the security cameras weren't working or in proper order that night. Par for the course of Mexico. Uh, months after Elijah's death, camera footage was obtained that showed multiple frustrating requests. Okay, now they're whining that they're not getting their stuff to information. All right. Minutes after Jamie left the bar, video footage clearly shows Elijah entering the elevator that Jamie had just entered. And it allegedly shows Elijah, who appears to be intoxicated. No shit, Sherlock. Stumbling through the elevator bank, pressing the elevator call buttons. With no immediate response from the elevator, he then walks to the opposite end of the elevator bank and begins ascending a circular stairwell inside the front of the hotel. The last video of surveillance is in which he's seen alive. That's it. And then he's like staggering off someplace. No other video was found. And then she went to sleep only to wake up at 3.30 discovering he had not returned. And they couldn't find him. But they found his body stuffed into a small window in a secluded section of the Sunset Royal Beach uh, uh, Hotel next to the resort. His torso and arms were hanging out of the small opening. His feet were dangling inside a bathroom. They ruled his death an accident. But the family believes he was murdered by whom? <laughs> now, this is where you get silliness. All right. You know, the concept is there's a whole bunch of Mexican guys just running around wanting to kill people for whatever reasons. So I, I can't see any information where they said he was robbed. Um, he's extremely drunk. He could already... He cannot figure out where he is. He's confused in the elevator. He goes out of the elevator. He's going down a circular staircase, which is nowhere going to his room. The guy is very, very disoriented and drunk. He goes someplace else. He thinks, oh, my God, here's a place. You know, maybe this is my my room. He's really out of his mind. And he, gets, he, he crawls in someplace and then dies. I have no problem with this being an accidental death. And the fact that they're trying to sue like everybody and then claiming the Mexican police are lying is sad because that man was an adult and he chose to drink himself to a level of such intoxication that he was not in control of himself. And that's, a, that's, that's sometimes the way it goes. So that's the first case, which I thought was interesting, which I did not see as being a, a homicide. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Sky Ricky says he was confused and so drunk. He went into the bathroom and the, win the window killed him probably after he fell a few times. He, it wasn't even his place, but you know, we, we no, I've done a few things. The, uh, the lamb, the lamb, uh, death. And what was the woman who went into the trash shoot? I've forgotten her name. Again, you have two people in very bad mental states they do really strange stuff and people who are very intoxicated and it was proven he was very intoxicated and was very confused. If, if there wasn't proof that he went into the elevator and couldn't figure out where he was going. And if he wasn't seen that he was going down circular staircases that weren't taking him to his room, I would say, well, maybe he went out and somebody attacked him, but who's going to shove him into a, a hotel window. That's not the way you attack people that, 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 so that, you know, the concept that that's the, the way things go is just nonsense. Um, people leave common sense and safety behind once they get to a resort. Oh, that is so true. It is like a playground for adults and they take great risks. They absolutely do. It, it's just, yes, I agree with this one. Personal responsibility. This is, hey, so let me tell you about the other case and we'll talk about both of them. Okay, the other case uh, was... Elliot, Elliot, um, do I have a picture of Elliot? I think this is Elliot. Oh, is it Elliot? Oh God, I'm right again. Oh my God, this is, you, I just won't let you drink tonight. The attorney for Elliot Blair's family says an autopsy performed to determine that he was murdered in Mexico. Here we go again. So here's the wife and she says Elliot Blair was murdered in Mexico. Was he? All right, let me read this one. 
All right, a private autopsy. Now you got to watch out for private autopsies because they will tell you anything you want. Uh, for the California lawyer who fell to his death from a resort balcony in Mexico has, has determined he was murdered. Um, and as it emerged that local cops shook him down just hours before his mysterious death. Now he was, there was a shakedown, but this is, you have to understand how things work. Now they were in Baja, California, which is on the complete other side from Cancun. But Baja has become a place where people in California can roll south. It's that little peninsula. And I've never been to Baja. I have been to Cancun, not one of my favorite places. Um, but uh, Baja is a little bit, it's a drier, it's more desert-like, um, but it's a very popular uh, place for people to move to who are expats and um, to just go visit. All right. A California public defender, Elliot Blair, whose death had been ruled an accident, had suffered bruising that did not match the account of local authorities in Baja, California. Uh, Baja, California, his family attorney said on Good Morning America, which is where you go. The autopsy confirms that he, Elliot Blair, was murdered that night. And also, he said there was evidence that suggests Blair may have been attacked by more than one man. Now, here's what happened. Uh, me, uh, a source close to the family told the... Told, said that two cops in Rosarito stopped Blair and his wife, Kimberly Williams, for rolling through a stop sign just hours before he died on January 14th. Uh, Blair didn't have the amount demanded for the alleged the alleged shakedown, but he handed over $160 and was, and was let go. All right. Are there shakedowns? I've never had a shakedown in Mexico. Um, my ex-husband did. Because he was down, he was there with his uh, second wife, uh, and my kids were down there, and apparently he did. There was a something that she I don't I forgot who was driving, but they I think that they kept the wife, not him. But anyway, um, there was a he, there was a thing at the police station. But anyway, my kids are like you know, uh, so so sometimes the certain things happen in Mexico and in Jamaica. He, he also got stopped in Jamaica, which he's from originally and um the police there in jamaica said he had guns in the in the trunk of the car in the boot of the car and he's like what and they were looking for money no here's money let me go he refused to do it give the money and they did let him go anyway so are there shakedowns from corrupt police in certain countries yes so i don't doubt this one and he gave them 160 dollars which is a pretty good amount of money for rolling through a stop sign <laughs> you know okay that was crooked that's corrupt all right that's the claim anyway, by the way, there's no proof of this. This is what the wife says. I don't know if it's true or not. And I'm certainly the police are going to say it's not true at all. Right. So I don't know if it's true, but I'm willing to believe it. Okay. All right. So it goes on. We've never been pulled over before, said Williams, who confirmed, confirmed the confrontation with the police to the news. We were both rattled, but at the same time, we both had this feeling of thank God they didn't do anything more to us. Okay. So they paid up, gave this money supposedly, and then drove away. Less than two hours later, Blair, 33, an Orange County deputy public defender, died after falling from the third floor of the hotel that they stayed in. His body was found clad in his underwear, t shirt, and socks. Okay, this is very important underwear, t shirt, and socks. All right. Um, the family wants the authorities to investigate the alleged shakedown and determine whether it had anything to do with Blair's death. Right here, I'm like, no, it didn't. Okay, <laughs> these guys, if they're gonna, they're doing this little corrupt thing where they stop your vehicle and say, hey, you did something wrong. And if you don't want to have to go to court and stay extra time, extra weeks in Mexico because your court date's going to be, hey, they do that in the U.S. too. You know, your court date's going to be two months from now. You want to come back to wherever, and you're like, no, and they say, okay, just pay the ticket. Just go and pay the ticket today. And you, therefore, you don't go to court and fight it because it's just not worth it. So in Mexico, it's like, you know, well, instead of the court date, they know it's like you're, you're not even from the country. So, hey, just pay us now. Um, once they got money in their hands, do you really think they give a crap about this couple once they drive away? They got some money. They're done with them. They're not going to pursue anything more. They got other fish to fry, you know. So the fact that they're saying that two hours later, somehow these corrupt cops came back and did something to them. Makes zero sense to me. All right. So then what happened? It says that she said she had been asleep 
when a security guard and the hotel manager woke her up and said, excuse me, miss, excuse me, miss, is, you, is this your boyfriend down here? I turned to my side and I didn't see him there. Because what she's saying is, and which is what she said, is that he was there prior. They went to bed together. Clearly he got out of bed and something happened to him. Because he was still in his, you know, not wearing many, much clothing. I mean, it wasn't like he got, it wasn't like he was walking around outside the hotel and got accosted. So, what the heck? So then she said, she turned around and said, she didn't see him there. And they're pointing over the side of the, out of our front door to the ground. My Elliot was down there on the ground. Uh, they said that his, Blair's death was a result of an unfortunate accident due to the fall of the deceased from a third floor. Pro prosecutor said a toxicology report came back, said there was considerable amount of alcohol in his body. His cause of death was listed as severe head trauma. So, uh, but the family doesn't believe it. They say he was a victim of a vicious crime. His wife also said he likely consumed five or six drinks over six hours that fateful night and was not so drunk that he'd fall over a balcony by accident. Now, five or six drinks. Uh, what are those five or six drinks containing? Because a lot of times in resort places, they're pretty strong drinks. Uh, sometimes, you know, they have three shots of liquor per drink, and that could be 15 shots. And who knows whether it was six hours or it's really three hours. You know, it's hard to know. But he was intoxicated. She goes, "I've and all the years of being with him, I've never seen him sloppy. But as you just pointed out, he's on vacation. And people get sloppy on vacation. They do. Um so now the con person consulting with the family is an injury expert. His name is Dr. Rami Hashish. That's an interesting name. <laughs> Hashish. Okay. Maybe he smokes it. Anyway, um, he doesn't really think that there is much evidence that points that it was an accident. She, he says, I think it's relatively clear the injury patterns don't add up with one another. There's bruising marks on his body. Well, that doesn't mean anything because sometimes when you fall, you, you fall over, you hit things on the way down. Um, there's indication of potentially being dragged to on the front of the body. Sometimes that also means you scraped against a building or against whatever. If you're falling over a balcony that, you know, some bricks or something are going by. And... Um, there's fracture to the back of the skull. Okay. So they discussed all these theories. He said, and she says, I just know it's not an accident. I know he didn't fall. I want to do everything we can to figure out what happened in that 45 minute hour or hour time span. So somebody came into the hotel room, dragged him out, beat him up and put him at the bottom of the balcony. Who does that? Nobody does that. What would be the point? The police came back and dragged him out of the hotel. How did he get out of the hotel room? I mean, he either went over the balcony or he had to leave by the door. Why would he leave by the door and go with, where? where's he going in his underwear? The whole thing is nonsensical. It's just not true. So people do stupid stuff when they're drunk, going out on the balcony, um, leaning over, maybe a throwing up. Um, and I will say this. I don't know that, I don't know if they've done any um, determinations on structural issues on the balcony. But I can tell you this, when you're in certain places in the world, you got to be careful where you stay and where you go because their, their, their regulations for safety are kind of weak. And so maybe that balcony wasn't well built. Um, maybe he tripped because, you know, I've told this story before. I'll just tell it again because I was, I think it's funny. So I was in Pozos, Mexico. I stayed at a hotel that was uh, an American lady had built. Um, and I was having dinner there with, with my husband and uh, we were having dinner with her and we we're having a great time and I got chilly. So I said, I'm going to run up and get my, 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 my a sweater. And so I, I ran up the stairs to our room and on the way I tripped and, and fell and broke my finger on one of the stairs. And the reason was because the stairs were not properly, ex they didn't have the same exact measurements so it's like instead of being whatever you know five inches and five inches and five inches it was like five inches five inches and six and a half inches so what happens is as you're going up you catch your toe because you're not expecting this step to be higher in other words 
not terribly well put together and not a lot of restrictions and rules on whether this can be done or not. It's, it's, it's poor building methods and carelessness. So I got my sweater and I came back down and sat down at the table and I showed my finger and I said, look, I broke my finger on your, your hotel stairs. And she looked at me and she says, well, you know what they say, you break your finger on a hotel stairs in America, you got a lawsuit. You break your finger on a hotel stairs in Mexico, you got a broken finger. <laughs> I got a free drink and that was it. And I laughed because I knew she was telling the truth, even though it was her hotel and her hotel stairs that broke my finger, but things don't, they're not necessarily as the, 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 the rules and regulations on safety aren't as strong in certain countries. I don't know if they ever did any checks on, was there something fishy about the balcony uh, that it was too low? I don't know. But I don't believe for a minute somebody came up to his room, dragged him out in his underwear, beat him up for no reason whatsoever and placed him under the balcony. No, I believe he walked out on the balcony and fell. So we have two cases here, which were accidental deaths in my opinion. But people are trying to sue because they think, you know, this is not true. Now, there is one case I'll point out down in uh, Tulum, Tulum, and uh, this particular case... Um, let me see if I have to, I might have, to, I think this is the, no, this is the location. This is Tulum. This is Tulum is in Mexico as well, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a South of uh, Cancun is up higher. And here is the, the woman uh, who was killed. Uh, she, she uh, was afraid of being in LA and her husband and, and she decided it would spend more time in Mexico where she felt safer. And unfortunately she went to a restaurant and there was a, some, some, cartel drug dealer something but somebody shot at somebody and she got shot and she died that was a homicide but think about this do you remember the parade recently for the kansas city chiefs and some jackass young kids ended up shooting at each other and they killed a, uh, killed a young woman that's the same kind of thing uh that's both of those were homicides it, it, it is the one in Mexico more meaningful as far as danger than the one in your in Kansas City going to a parade and you get shot by some some two kids with some illegal guns shooting at each other in a, in a public location. Same thing, public location in Tulum was a restaurant that got mapped. She was in the way. She, she, she got hit. That's homicide. The other two look like accidents to me. I, I don't see any any homicides in either one of those. Okay, so let me check out some of your comments. That you're all sober, haven't had a drink yet, haven't messed up a picture. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> so proud of myself. Um, uh, Christy says, I've never understood why Southern Californians who live among the best vacation sp spots go to Mexico. Um, well, Mexico's great. I'm going to say this. I, I, I think the, the anti-Mexico thing is too strong. I've been to Mexico five times. I love Mexico City, one of the best cities in the world. It is full of beautiful parks, great food, friendly people. It's just wonderful. Mexico City's what I have to say, probably my favorite city in the world. Um, I've also been in all kinds of smaller cities. I, I don't like, I don't like Cancun and uh, stuff that area because it's all touristy and it's just annoying. Um, but I, I like the I like to go inland and go to stay. In, I've stayed in a lot of small cities in, in, in uh, Mexico. People have been wonderful places have been felt I felt very safe and never had an issue in Mexico but you know I do stay out of cartel territory <laughs> I don't buy drugs um but could I get killed accidentally sure but I can get I'm, but DC's Washington DC's become very dangerous recently and so even where I live in Bowie Maryland I mean this used to be one of the safest places ever and we people are getting killed here and they're being carjacked right and left I mean it's like it's, it's insanity so I think Mexico is a beautiful country. I think it's got many beautiful places. Are there some places where you shouldn't go? Absolutely. And also there's some times a day and, and, and certain streets maybe you shouldn't go down. But it's, it's, it's a great country. And I think it's sometimes you get some. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. I was in Mexico when I was nine. I liked it when I wasn't barfing. Why are you barfing? <laughs> I, I like I like that. Uh, I, I don't, I've never barfed in Mexico yet. Uh, I've never barfed any place in the world. I, I'm a big street food eater and I've eaten all the street food in Mexico and in India. 
And the only time I've ever gotten food poisoning was at uh, Whole Foods in Maryland. And I sued them because it, I didn't get much for it, but I lost 10 days of my life throwing up and having, oh, it was horrible. Um, do men get roofied? Not by women usually, but by men sometimes. Yes. And also some people roofie themselves because they like their, the results of, of the actual drug. So that's true. Um, let's see. Oh, my Tulum has beautiful Mayan ruins. Yes. Um, they're very pretty there. Um, my favorite ruins though, if you ever, if you ever go to Mexico, uh, you definitely want to go to Tehuacan, which is just outside of Mexico city. It's about 30 minute ride. Most amazing, amazing pyramids. I just think that well, that's a fabulous place. Um, just absolutely worth it. That's my favorite place. Chichen Itza I wasn't so thrilled about. That's near Cancun. Didn't do a lot for me. Very touristy. But 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 uh, uh, but uh, Tewa Tewa Khan. Whew. It's stunning. It's so it's such a huge complex and it's just amazing. Um, so go to Mexico City. It's a fabulous city. And then roll over to Tewa Tewa Khan on the bus and yeah, it's really nice. So oh, I'm missing Mexico now. Yeah, I'm feeling sad. Um, let's see. Um, what else you have to say? Um, <laughs> you got food poisoning in Mexico. You got what? You know, the funny thing is, um, depends where you eat. I mean, I eat street food there, and I've never been sick once. I I went down there once with a guy, and he. He refused to eat the street food and he ate the food in the tourist restaurant. He got deathly ill. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> yay. Yes, it's a one. Mexico City is fabulous, really. It's, it's a great, great city. So, so fun. Such a, such a wonderful place. And there's a lot of places right around Mexico City are also great. It's just all the inland cities. I absolutely love them because there's no tourists there. I mean, the tourists aren't there. They're, they're all they're all at the beaches. So when you go there, it's more it's more it's it's just the some some of those cities are just so lovely. Um, they they just have such a good vibe to them and a lot of cultural stuff going on. So it's, it's really great. Okay, what else do I want to talk about? Um, let me go look at my pictures. No, <laughs> let me go see. Let's see what time I got. Okay, I got a little more time. Um. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I have been asked to talk about a bunch of things, um, but this is, um, oh my goodness, the mur this, this is the murder of uh, Jennifer Dulos. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, but um, this is this is her picture. Oh, I got it right again. I'm just doing so good. I'm so proud of myself. I really am. This is her, and she's she. Uh, uh, this is a case of another woman who helps her boyfriend get rid of the ex-wife. It just always amazes me and claims, of course, she didn't do it. But what happened was. She, she went missing on uh, May 24th, 2019. They believe she was killed in a violent attack in her, in her home. Her ex-husband, Fotis Dulos, and his girlfriend, Michelle Tr Traconis. And here, 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 I think, is the picture of her looking sad in court. Let's see if I'm right. There, there she is. Oh, get it again. Michelle Traconis listens as a verdict of guilty on all counts. Oh, she's so sad. She is sad. Anyway, she is sad. And she said she had nothing to do with this. Anyway, uh, she was arrested. Um, they were both arrested on charges of tampering with evidence and hindering the prosecution uh, con you know, connected to the disappearance. Well, what's interesting about it is that he he committed suicide while awaiting, you know, while awaiting trial. I uh, said, I didn't do it. No, I can't take it. Okay. Uh, so Jennifer and Fotis were the mid in the midst of a contentious divorce. In child custody proceedings, police believe Fotis lay in wait uh, for Jennifer, attacking her when she returned home after dropping her children off at school. In the evening, he and Traconis drove to Hartford to dispose of garbage bags containing items with Jennifer's blood on them. There, you know, so here we have um, Sad Sack. 
sad sack Michelle here. I didn't know anything, but you went to dispose of her, the, the bloody clothing, clearly in a trash can. Uh, so what happened here? So she disappears. Now listen to some of this. Is, uh, she disappears. She, she missed some doctor's appointment. So they knew something had happened to her. Um, her Range Rover was in the garage. And they thought it was weird because why wouldn't she take that? <clears throat> but instead, her Chevy, Chevrolet Suburban was missing. When they searched the house, they found blood spatter on the floor, a door, and a wall in the garage, as well as on the exterior, exterior of the Range Rover. Blood was also found in the kitchen. DNA tests revealed most of the blood to be Jennifer's, apart from blood on a kitchen faucet, which belonged to her and the ex-husband, Fotis. And they also found other evidence that she was a victim of a serious assault. But then this is what happened. So Jennifer's Suburban was seen leaving the area, captured on a, a, a security camera from the neighbor, uh, leaving about 1025 that morning. Fotis was believed to be the one driving the victim's vehicle, carrying the body of Jennifer and other items associated with the probable cleanup. The same evening, about 730, Fotis and Traconis were captured on video <laughs> dumping garbage bags in 30 bins in Hartford. <laughs> you know, 30 bins. The trash bags are found to contain various pieces of bloody clothing and bloodstained cleaning items. Now, so 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 let's here, here's pretty sad, sad Michelle again. I had no idea what was in those bags. So why do you think your boyfriend, or I think that's what he was at the time, needs to go to these locations to get rid of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, they, 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 his DNA was found inside a glove in one of the trash bags. Um, and then the suburban was dumped near her home, uh, three miles away. Uh, let's see what else happened. Um, they believed he arrived by bike at Jennifer's home. Okay. So he took his bike, I guess bike. And so they, I think maybe they mean bicycle. Due to tire marks found, the guys are really, you know, when you're going to kill off your ex, you really got to do a better job. So there are tire marks and he, then he lay, waited for her, killed her in the garage. Uh, and then there was, after that, no activities on her uh, cards or phone. So she's clearly dead somewhere, but they haven't, I don't think they found her body. Uh, but let's see. Um, they've been searching, searching. Has not been, her body has not been found. But she's, they were, they're trying to declare her legally dead. One of the reasons, uh, this is one of the few cases you could charge somebody with a homicide without a body because the, there's so much indication in the home and in the vehicle and in the trash bags that indicate she was murdered. I mean, this is, this is where you got overkill, essentially, as far as evidence goes. Uh, you know, it's hard to prove. Somebody just disappears and you're pretty much sure the guy killed that woman, but there's no absolute proof like blood spatter all over the place. But, um, so he had a, they arrested him. Um, and then he committed suicide cause he didn't, I guess he knew he was going down. Didn't feel like going to prison. And then, um, Oh, he had a new girlfriend by that time. <laughs> his, his, his girlfriend at the time. Uh, yeah. She, she, I guess she was, I don't know. She had a new girlfriend named Anna Curry. So I guess she, why would you have, what girl goes with a guy who supposedly killed his wife? You know, go figure there. But anyway, <laughs> just, you know, there's not much to say except yes. Um, he pretty much killed his ex and, and a girlfriend who was with him. I mean, seriously, um, you're going to help him out here. But, you know, we see that we see so often that a girl, a woman will help her boyfriend off the ex as if, which is just boggles my mind. Uh, there's five kids. So apparently she, there, there might have been an issue, a financial issue. But the ex did have um, the woman who was killed apparently had enough money. You know, sometimes I'll say this and, and people don't like it, but I'll say it anyway. Sometimes it's better to cut your losses. Because she had had issues with that, her husband, and threat threats from him. She was scared of him. Don't you know? And, and yes, a person should have to pay for for you know 
they should pay child support. Of course they should. That, that That's their children. But my God, I'm sometimes, you know, it's better to walk away. Because if you already think that they're a threat to your life, you know, poking that bear doesn't help. And is it right? No, it's not right. They, they should. It's not right. But sometimes it's worth walking away and lose. I've told women this sometimes that like they're in a bad relationship and they're like, well, I don't want to walk away from my apartment. I'm like, well, it's, it's not right, but do you want to be killed? I mean, if I were you, I'd walk away. Yeah. You're going to, maybe you lose stuff. Maybe you lose belongings. Maybe you can only take what you can carry. Um, maybe you're going to lose money because you know, you're going to have to pay them, whatever, but I'm not going to walk away. Well, then you end up dead. So, so you always have to balance out whether it's not a matter of what's right and wrong. It's a matter of survival. And, and, you know, if you picked a bad apple <laughs> and then found out later it was a bad apple, you know, maybe you just got, you just get out of there, you know? And so again, I'm not bl blaming the victim for what happened to her, but I just, I just say to myself sometimes, you know, I just like to save women from being killed. And a lot of times women are killed by their boyfriends and, and husbands. And it's because they didn't get out sooner or because they, 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 they didn't, sometimes you have to disappear. I mean, it's horrible. You know, it's, you, you can give, you can give a restraining order. That means it's garbage. Restraining order basically says you can put check marks in if they break, break the restraining order. But meanwhile, your life is in danger. Um, and so, you know, there, there's ways to fight back, uh, but you have to, you know, every one of those is risky. I mean, you know, maybe you need to arm yourself. And any time you go out, you look for the guy, make sure you can shoot him first. Make sure he can't break into your house and kill you. Um, get big dogs, get, you know, live, live with mean guys. I mean, whatever you got to do or, or disappear. Sometimes, you know, it's just, it's so sad. But, you know, relationships can be very, very dangerous. And sometimes I just think you got to cut your losses. You know, that's not a popular thing to say, but sometimes it's worth moving on. And I, I sometimes think to myself, well, you know, at one point in my life, I didn't have jack shit. So if I don't have jack shit again, but I have my life, maybe that's worth something. That's just, that's just an aside. <laughs> oh my goodness. Just cause I, 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 I say, I find, I find it so sad. Oh, did she really? She hired bodyguards and they separated, but let them go. <sighs> Wish she kept them around a little longer. Oh my God. Ah, uh, yeah. What, 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 wait a sec. Um, Oh, the supervised visits. Yeah. Yeah. Those are concerned. Um, she got the kids out, but now she's dead. So oh, it's just so sad. Mm. Let's see. Um, <laughs> we're thirsty. Please mess up some pictures. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me try one more. Let's see. Um, let's see. I don't have a picture for this one. I just thought it was interesting. So that's not going to help you. I can't do that one. Then. Oh, let's do the Oregon. No, I don't have any pictures of that either. But did you, have you heard about the Oregon dad who, who uh, there's no pictures of this because they don't want anybody to see. Um, the, they don't want to put the kids uh, faces out there. Um, this one is the, um, where is it? Where is it? I'm looking for it. This is the guy in California. Uh, I think it was California. Okay, does it matter if I can't find the find the article? Will that will that help you? You can drink. Okay, I found it. <laughs> Oregon Dad. Oregon Dad. He drugged his daughter's twelve year old friends at a sleepover with laced smoothies. This is the creepiest story, and they have no pictures. And I think it's they're protecting the kids. Michael Maiden, 57, is facing six felony charges and three misdemeanors in connection with the sleepover. Now, if all of this is true, this guy should go to prison for the rest of his life, in my opinion. An Oregon father allegedly drugged his daughter's 12-year-old friends with lace smoothies and subsequently watched as he drifted off to sleep during a sleepover. Now, one could say he just was tired of them making a lot of noise, but I don't think that's the issue. Um, so he surrendered. Uh, he was indicted by a grand jury on multiple charges. This happened in August. Officers, officers responded to a hospital in August after three 12-year-old girls tested positive for 
uh, benzodiazepine, a depressant that produces sedations and hypnosis. The girls told officers they were at a friend's house the night before for a sleepover in which Maiden, their friend's father, made mango smoothies. Mango smoothies. These are tasty smoothies. And insisted they drink them. The girls watched movies and did facials in the basement before Maiden allegedly pressured them to drink the laced smoothies. The smoothies had tiny white chunks throughout and sprinkled on top. One girl attempted to decline the smoothie, but Maiden allegedly insisted she try it. She then said she had a few sips but did not drink much of the smoothie. And Maiden monitored her consumption and grew angry when he observed the girls drinking out of each other's drinks. He claimed he gave each of them a different colored reusable straw and insisted they drink out of their own cup. Police said one girl reported feeling woozy, hot, and clumsy after drinking the smoothie before falling over, blacking out, and going into a thick, deep sleep. Another girl managed to stay awake and said she could feel him watching her by her, his, his presence as she kept her eyes shut, pretending to be asleep. She said she believed he was doing tests to make sure they weren't awake including by allegedly putting his finger under the girl's nose and twice moving a girl's arm and body on the bed during his repeated trips to the basement where the girls were sleeping. The girl stayed awake, good for her, for fear that Maiden was going to do something, which I'm pretty sure he was. The, she texted her mother, good for her, asking her to come and pick her up because she did not feel safe around Maiden. Mom, please pick me up and say I had a family emergency. I don't feel safe. I might not respond, but come and get me. Crying emoji. Please, please pick up. Please, please. Oh, that makes me kind of sad. I, I, the, what, what, got, what, what gets me in this is where she said, I might not respond. She's aware that she may not be awake much longer because she might, the drugs might take effect and she's trying to get her mother there to save her. I, I think that's a brilliant thing that she did. The affidavit said the girl was eventually able to get in touch with a family friend, which I don't know what she was having trouble getting a mom, but she kept texting other people, which is also brilliant. I love this girl who came and picked her up and woke up the girl's parents who notified the other girl's parents at 3 a.m. When the parents of the other girls drove to Maiden's house to pick them up, he resisted and asked them to return in the morning. They're coming to get their children. Did you won't let them get their kids? Yeah, that's a big, big suspicious number one right there. The parents informed him that they would be bringing their children home immediately. One of the girls allegedly could not walk on her own and kept asking what happened, which prompted her parents to take her to the hospital. When officers spoke to the girl less than 12 hours after she drank the smoothie, they said she walked slowly and used the assistance of her mother for balance. Her eyelids were heavy. She spoke slowly. Maiden was charged six months after the sleepover took place. He's facing six felony charges and three misdemeanors, causing another to ingest a controlled substance. Now, my question is how he, this to be is, is an attempted sexual assault, and I wish he would get a lot of time for that. But he, according to court records, Maiden and his wife divorced on October 17th, less than two months after the sleepover. I don't know where she was during the sleepover, but I'm guessing not there. Uh, and I will say this to parents. I say this all the time. And again, this is one of these things people don't like because, but I say, if you do not trust the parent and anybody the parent would have in the house to the level that you would trust yourself or your own mother, your child should not be there. I know everybody loves to do sleepovers. And I remember when I was growing up, I mean, I wasn't real popular, so <laughs> I didn't do a lot of sleepovers. But I remember the sleepover at Martha's house. I do. Martha, that was one of, I think maybe that was the only sleepover I went to. And then I remember we did, you know, the thing with the thing, the um, feather, uh, light as a feather, light as a feather, where you pick the person, the, the person, the girl up, she lays in the middle, and you pick her up. And then when you freak out, you drop her and she you know, smashes to the ground. Um, and they, we did a bunch of, you know, the weird stuff, the Ouija board and all that kind of crap. And I don't remember Martha's parents. And I'm pretty sure my parents didn't know Martha's parents. But in those days, it was uh, like 1970. Um, I'm pretty sure they just went, sure, go, go ahead, you know. But when my kids were growing up, my kids never stayed at anybody's house unless I trusted the, the parents. 
I mean, there's, you can't always be, you know, you could believe somebody was trustworthy and find out that they're not. There's no way you can win all the time. But I made sure my kids didn't go to somebody's house. Oh, you know, my friend's mother and then a friend's mother has a creepy boyfriend. No, no, no. You're not going to stay over there. You're not even going to their house. She can come to our house, but you're not going to her house. So I was always very strict about that. Um, as I, I was not willing to take a risk on whoever was there that I did not know well enough. Because if you're, if my child is a jerk at another person's house, I want that confidence. Like my granddaughter, we have, um, my daughter has a couple friends, um, the best friends. And um, I've spent a lot of time with them too. And I love them. And, and that's the one place my granddaughter spends, has done overnights with. Because we all do trust the parents. We like them very much. And we've known them for a very long time now. And they're my, my daughter's friends, but I really like them. Um, and their kids stay at, over here, but it's, but then my granddaughter, I don't think she stays at anybody else's house, just that one, because they've determined those are the safe people. And my daughter is a detective. So <laughs> I think she pretty good at sussing people out. So, um, let's see what you say. Uh, my 13 year old friends had a great system. Each would tell their parents they were staying at the other's house. So they would stay out all night long. Oh, my God. Oh, clever little creatures, I tell you. Uh, Pat, the sleepover was for the kids. Why were you here, too, in your pajamas? I have no idea what you're talking about. What? What pajamas are we talking about? Are we talking to a different Pat or are you talking to me? I'm a little confused. Strange things happen in the chat room that I'm not. Sometimes when I go to the chat room, guys, just in case you've never been in the chat room, um, you know, everybody's talking in between. And sometimes I miss out on the context of things. And then I don't know what the hell anybody's talking about. Um, oh, do you remember that? Uh, hi, Christy. Thanks for the memories, Pat. I recall the light as a feather sleepover game. It was it was so weird, that light as a feather thing. Because, I mean, it's like, it, I don't know, but... Didn't it work, it, you know, because you had like this, this girl lying there. And for some reason, I think you used two, I think we used two fingers. Like it was like this. And you picked the girl up somehow. The group around was like maybe eight girls picked the person up and you actually got them up in the air and go light as a feather, light as a feather, light as a feather. And then they usually, usually end up dropping them at some point. But how the heck were they actually lifted into the air? <laughs> I'm not even sure. <laughs> um uh, well, there's truth. Oh, sorry. Where is that one? <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's see. Jill says, mom's rules, no sleepers, and nothing good ever happens after midnight. Ah, that is such, that nothing good ever happens after midnight is so true. So true. Um, uh, Let's see. Um, oh, that's good. Okay. Clarissa says we had like two friends we were allowed to sleep over. Yeah. It, you know, the problem is so many times kids want to go to somebody's house and you just never know what's happening at that person's house unless you actually know them. If you know them, then you can be pretty confident that your children are going to be safe. And they don't, they're also not going to have such strange friends like drug dealers and stuff like that because you never know. You never know because well, there were, we had a relative um, and th that relative wanted my kids to come and hang out and I like her. I do. But I did hear the story where she was at the house one day and some bad people came over and they all jumped out the windows. <laughs> I don't want my kid over there. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I'm thinking maybe you're all involved in something not too kosher, you know? So yeah. So that's why we never let the kids go there. Yeah. Um, True, truth or dare. Oh my god. <laughs> oh goodness. Um let's see. Um oh you had a very very strict upbringing. Well, strictness isn't too too bad. Uh you know, creepy uncle. Yes, creepy uncle could be visiting. So that's that's the whole point that you have to be sure that wh wherever the kids are going to be that the parents have the sense not to have the creepy uncle there. That's, that's the problem. And, and sometimes the, the, the people don't have any sense. Creepy uncle is there. So you really want to know 
what their what they what their thinking is. Um, because like if, if my granddaughter's staying over with me, there's no creepy dude hanging around. So one of the reasons my daughter has faith and trust in me is because she knows I don't have creepy friends. <laughs> and when my granddaughter's here, I'm especially extraordinarily careful with her because I consider myself, you know, if I'm being asked to care for my grandchild, then I have to do, I have to be all that more aware that I make sure my grandchild is returned home in one piece and healthy, you know? Uh, so, but my daughter believes that that is true of me. Um, now there's some other relatives she may not choose to leave my granddaughter with. Maybe they'll visit, you know, get together in a picnic or something, but that kid's not, she's not going to be alone with them. That's a different matter. Even though, you know, people are scared of her because she is a detective, <laughs> you know, so it does help. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, so I'm trying to see. Wait a minute. <laughs> Some very funny conversations which I can't can't quite. Let's see what we are. okay. One more. Okay, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see if one more. Let's see. I'm gonna give you one more chance to get. No, I just. I think I covered everything because I was gonna do uh, uh, Madeline Soto and a separate whole thing. Uh, but I, let me just okay. This um. Uh. Oh, okay. I'm going to talk about, I don't have a picture. Sorry. But somebody asked me, uh, I think it was Sarah. Sarah, you asked me. Um, by the way, Sarah, you did ask me whether I, I do, I, I, I still, because the thing I did about should I have sex on a first date? And I was talking about people doing um, uh, internet dating and dating sites like match.com and Harmony. And yes, I tried two sites once during my 20 years of not being married. And I, I tried, I, I, like one was like five years after I was divorced and the other one was like 10 years after I was divorced. And I only tried it like a, like for like a week. And it was so, the guys are so repulsive that I like, yeah, I'm done with this crap. So no, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Um, but you also asked about the Karen Reed case and um, there is some action on the Karen Reed case. Um, I don't know if you remember, I did a thing on Turtle Boy. So let me tell you about Karen Reed, and this will be the last thing I talk about. I don't have a picture because I, I just pulled this up just right before the show. Um, Karen Reed was the woman in uh, Boston who she and her, her, uh, her cop boyfriend were out drinking. And then she supposedly dropped him off at this house of other police officer house and uh, he ended up dead in the lawn and they found him frozen to death the next morning. And she was arrested because the, the case the prosecutors brought forth was that they were both drinking. And then when he got out of the vehicle, she hit him with the vehicle and then left him to die. Um, Turtle boy is this um, character who considers himself a journalist, but he's more, more of an activist and he does things that are, really questionable. He has his own, he has his own YouTube channel. He's got a huge amount of followers, but he's been out there protesting that the police are railroading Karen Reed and he's, she's innocent, blah, blah, blah. And he got arrested for being a real pain in the butt. Um, I don't know if that's, a, <laughs> get, you can get charged with being a pain in the butt, but they have, they had more, you know, proper, proper terms for that. But he, he's, um, I, I did. I, if I can remember, I'll link that below. I've done. I did something on Turtle Boy, and I got a whole bunch of flack from Turtle Boy lovers. And anyway, so Karen Reed, the case is still. It's just waiting and waiting to be taken care of. So she was charged with second degree murder in the killing of O'Keefe, a Boston police officer, who was found dead outside a Canton home, January of twenty twenty two. So now we're in twenty four. So we're two years in already. Um, so there's a there. It's a very interesting case. I'll, yeah, I'll try to I'll link below the um, my whole analysis of the case. But now they've got new evidence, which is interesting because a lot of the claims is that she loved him and this didn't happen. And somebody inside the he somehow went inside the house. She left. He went inside the house and there was a fight and the dog bit him. This so he got bit by a dog and then they they attacked. They beat him up and then threw him out into the lawn to leave him to die. It's a, the whole story is so stupid. It's it's just nonsensical. But anyway, um, but Karen Reed, there's a lot of stuff. 
that point to Karen Reed actually hitting with her vehicle. But now they've said this. They have new information. They shared witness accounts that suggested her relationship with O'Keefe was strained at the time of death. So this is important because the question is why would she why would she be she was also intoxicated, but why would she be in the mood the the mindset that she would like hit him and then just drive away? Well, it says here that um first of all they reco they recovered O'Keefe's DNA from the recovered broken taillight of Reed's vehicle. She the concept is she she backed up and hit him. He was holding like a wine glass and got out of the car and said she hit him and there, his DNA is supposedly in the broken taillight. Now, of course, Turtle Boy say it was planted, but you know, that's what he does. Um, and they also found, so this is what happened. Reed and O'Keefe were out drinking January 28, 2022, with a group of people, including Boston police officer Brian Albert. Members of the group went back to Albert's Fairview Road home. Reed says she dropped O'Keefe off and went home. He was found the next morning and pronounced dead at the hospital. Prosecutors allege Reed hit O'Keefe with her SUV and left him to die. But Reed's attorneys have said evidence points to O'Keefe being attacked inside the home and brought outside, arguing among the guests, the, uh, arguing among other points, that the wounds on the body are not consistent with a crash. Like So these police officers just took him outside, dumped him in the snow, and let him die. The dis district attorney's office now says a small hair found stuck on the rear, rear passenger side of Reed's SUV has been identified as belonging to O'Keefe. So now they suppose they have DNA with a headlight, the taillight and, and a hair. Through a trace analysis of forensic testing, they discovered the victim's DNA present on the broken taillight and microscopic pieces of red and clear apparent plastic located in the victim's clothing, which would, again, the contact between the car and him. Uh, co comparison testing was uh, conducted, and the results demonstrate that the microscopic pieces of red and clear plastic are consistent with the broken pieces of plastic from the defendant's rear taillight. Uh, also, the document points a picture of a relationship turmoil between Reed and O'Keefe. The officer's niece and nephew, who were in his care for years following the death of their parents, described frequent arguments and in interviews with the police. Um, they said that, and also, this is the one I find interesting, in voicemails recovered from O'Keefe's phone, which the district attorney's office said were left in a time period surrounding his the death, Reed allegedly screamed, Jeff, uh, Reed, that's the woman, allegedly screamed, John, I hate you, calling him a pervert and accusing him of cheating on her. They went apparently to Aruba a month before his death, and she thought he was kissing somebody, and so she thought he was cheating on her. So it was quite volatile. And you're right. Um, so there were those texts, um, and then, yeah, she, she told friends that he was cheating on her. Uh, so anyway... The, the the trial is now going to begin March 12th, and uh, um, there's a request from the prosecutors and the attorneys to delay it. My God, they keep delaying and delaying this this thing. But anyway, what do I think? I think that the evidence points to Reed hitting him with a vehicle and leaving him to die. I think the evidence is pretty heavy toward that. I think Turtle Boy is a nutcase, and I, I say nutcase because I can't say the the p word because that would I might be. <laughs> I can't call him that because I'm not a, a, psych, a psychologist and I can't label him in such a way. It's not a nutcase either. He's just, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> you, can, you can see my thing on Turtle Boy. Oh, Lord, that guy's a piece of work. But anyway, um, let's say, uh, yeah, she, she was definitely drunk, but the, the, it wasn't just so that she was drunk. It's that what happened afterwards, but the, but Turtle Boy came in and he, they have made, they've, they've twisted so many things and claiming that the, the whole police department, the ambulance people, everybody in the world is in this big collusion to nail the crime on, on Karen Reed. It's just, it's just ludicrous. And, you know, I don't mind a person having a, a different opinion. I don't mind that he wants to present a different but he gets out there and he's done a lot of things which are not legal. Um, harassment, threatening witnesses. I mean, he's he's, he's um, got a whole, yeah. So that's why he has been charged with numerous uh, little things. <laughs> Being a pain in the ass, mostly, but uh, that's his problem. So, um, but we're going to find out when, when um, 
uh, uh, yeah, I mean, theoretically, um, oh, she seems to be actually orchestrating that. She's, yeah, Karen Reed seems to be in collusion a bit with Turtle Boy. It, it's very complicated, but Turtle Boy has a huge following uh, and he gets tremendous amounts of supports on his channel. He's got a high level of, um, he's got his own Turtle Boy website and then he's got a massive amount of subscribers on his channel. It's just appalling because, um, and, and so many people believe in him. I mean, they're just like, oh my God, Turtle Boy, he's the most, bad. he's just a journalist. He's just doing the best thing. He's trying to prevent corruption. He's trying to save Karen Reed. It's like, okay, yeah, okay. But, you know, yeah, Turtle Boy. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so he's, um oh, He's been in and out of jail. Well, recently he has. He, he then that I'll I'll go with that. Um, he's 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 got a lot more issues than that. So he's um yeah. But anyway, okay, that's gonna be it. I'm sorry I didn't give you another. I gave no opportunities for y'all to drink. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> but if you go back and watch my vanishing triangle, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I hope you do watch it. Um, uh, it's a fascinating issue about the the irish cases about these women going missing and um but i had like the worst trouble with with the pictures in that show and i couldn't find anything and i and i apologize for that because um it, i've had a kind of a long month um with a, a relative um close to me uh who was dealing with health issues and i spent a lot of time in the er and and doctor stuff and and it's good it's gone relatively good news recently but i I, I lost a lot of time during the month and I was pretty stressed out and I was like trying to catch up with everything. So by the time I did the vanishing triangle, I was so far behind before that show. And I was like throwing everything together. So, <laughs> so I'm, I thought about editing it, but I don't have the energy to edit it. So I'll probably just put it up as it is. And God, God knows. I, I think the show is still good. I think it's just, I lost my train of thought in my pictures. Like, so yeah, if you haven't seen it yet and you want to drink till every time I lost a picture, you will be <laughs> they will be carting you away. <laughs> they will be carting you away. <laughs> I'm a mere mortal. I didn't know that. I did. Um, thank you. Well, well, you know, um, thing, things things are getting better. Things are getting better. Uh, the test came back uh, in a, in a, as best as best could be, and much 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 better than was expected. So it was a, it was a long month and um, yeah. So anyway, but things are better. So uh, not perfect, but better. <laughs> oh, aren't you nice? <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's life. You know, we, you can't, you can't, you can't escape things in life and life goes on and, uh, you know, uh, either things happen to us or things happen to people around us. And all we can do is be there for them and, um, and, and survive it, you know, until, you know, they have to survive us. You know? So, uh, yeah. But anyway, thank you for being here. And um, I'm glad I didn't have to drink more than one, <laughs> one shot of tequila myself. <laughs> but you're all great. <laughs> And again, if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and check the click on Patreon if you want to be here with this great group. And I, I always say I appreciate I appreciate my patrons because not only do you support the channel, but it's fun to be here with you because doing you know I, I always when um oh, what's his name um geez now I forgot his name <laughs> um. Mm -mm, just detective you know just what what's his name I just bl I'm blanking. The detective, uh, 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 Ken Maines, Ken Maines, um, he got fed up with uh, the the negative comments, so he's put he's blocked all all commenting on his his channel. And I sort of get it, you know, because it can be overwhelming. But you know, I don't like doing just videos. I mean, I do videos in between, but just doing videos it makes me feel very um, distant from everybody. Like I'm living in this like little separate world where I just do my own thing and then I just go away. And it's just kind of, it's kind of lonely and um, it, it's not interactive. And I prefer, I prefer to have communications where I know there's real human beings out there, <laughs> somebody out there in the universe, you know, it's like, I like that. So I'm, I'm glad for that. So, yeah. And so I'm glad for all of you being here. Thank you all for being at the, 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 um, 
Oh, case. What what case did I'm doing? I'm doing okay. The case for Saturday is going to be the um is going to be. I'm going to probably put up the link tomorrow. It's going to be the Station Strangler took place in South Africa. Uh, it's a long string of uh, murdered uh, boys. Um, and there's a new show out. It's called uh, Catch Me a Killer. I had to use my VPN to see it. Oh, where did I go? I went to Australia to see it. Oddly, I found, I'll, I'll, I'll try to send those links over. I went up to Australia to see it and I was able to see it for free. Um, uh, so, yeah, was it free? I think it was actually free. So I saw the first two. It's it that's a fictionalized thing on the profiler who did worked on that case and then all her other cases. So she's got a she's got a show based on her. And I also bought her book. Um and I, I knew about her years ago, this profiler, and I have I have I have issues I do with her. I mean, some really strange stuff. And so I'm gonna be talking about that case and also profiling. How do you actually profile serial homicides? Um because some of the stuff I see claimed in this case, I just don't believe. Um, and then they, the guy that they caught, it, it's, fa the, it's quite fascinating how he got convicted. And there's an Innocence Project that's been trying to fight for him. And, you know, me and Innocence Projects in general don't get along. But there are some strange things about this guy and his conviction and whether he was actually the, the station strangler or not. Very, it's a really fascinating case. And the whole issue of profiling is also quite fascinating. So I'll send all that over to you guys tomorrow. Um, and so I'll be doing that on Saturday. I might do a little bit earlier so that anybody from South Africa who would like to tune in can actually you know, see the show, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I have any patrons who are from South Africa. I'm trying to remember now. So it might be pointless. <laughs> But I'll, I'll figure it out. I have to figure on Sunday. I'm going to go say do something else with family. But um, I'm looking forward to doing this one because I find it really an interesting case. And I should be well put together way more so than on the Vanishing Triangle because I, I, I'm, I'm ahead of the game now and I am in a more relaxed mood. So I hope you'll come to that. And it, it's really, really fascinating. And so I thank the patron who brought that information to me and said, hey, Pat, can you do this thing about the Station Strangler? And I, I and I will. So, all right. So, oh, <laughs> the Mexican cases, they were really interesting. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I never, I hadn't heard about them. And again, I tell you all of you that, you know, I do check the news every day and some, I start picking out things for the hangout for the week, but then I always ask for your, your ideas. So some of them end up in a hangout and some of them end up as full shows because a lot of things I don't know about, especially all, all over the world, well, even, even in Maryland, you know, sometimes I have no clue about a certain case. And I have a long, long list of cases that I'm going to do at some point. So, you know, I may not get around to them for a year because there's so many, um, so many interesting cases. But I learn a lot of them from you. So thank you for sending me in all your ideas. That's fantastic. So anyway, thank you for being here, everybody. And I will see you hopefully on Saturday for the Station Strangler. Bye-bye, everybody.